Good morning. It's good to see your smiling face. We're going to start off this morning in honor of our nation's birthday, and we're going to sing America the Beautiful, page 630. If you will, stand with me. One of the best ways we've found to fight trafficking in Karamoja is to stop it before it can occur. And so we've partnered with our local schools to bring awareness and education about trafficking to the students there. We have two programs that help us to do that. One of those is our school meal program. In the poor communities of Uganda, the schools do not provide a meal for the children during the day and therefore the dropout rate is high and school performance is very low. And so providing a healthy meal for each child every day in school encourages school attendance and it improves their school performance. Our second program is Straightway. Straightway partners with local schools to teach girls about sexual purity and hygiene. Because of the poor conditions in these communities, most of these girls don't have the sanitary products that they need and therefore they're unable to attend school. Straightway teaches them how to make their own sanitary products so they can attend school and even make and sell these items in the marketplaces to generate income. Both of these school programs encourage attendance and produce an environment more conducive to learning and good health. We have found that keeping children in school drastically reduces their chance of being trafficked. Next week on Freedom Day, the first phase of the Survivor Program will begin and the first girls will arrive at the Hope Center. Their journey to freedom has only just begun. They have been rescued from their captors and set free, and now we begin the fight to keep them free. Our efforts to prevent human trafficking in Karamoja have been amazingly successful, and we are ready to expand these programs. 
as survivors of human trafficking are released from our program filled with hope and promise for their future, we will be sending them equipped to start similar programs in their villages and communities. Changing the harmful thinking of the parents who sell their children into slavery or community leaders who turn a blind eye may seem like an insurmountable task. But we know that the power of the gospel is strong enough to break through the darkness in Karamoja. Our fight has just begun, and we won't stop until Karamoja becomes a place where trafficking is no longer allowed to exist. All right. That is the Allen family ministry that we've been a part of. Uh, this was the last. We actually were scheduled to show that last week with homecoming. We didn't show it, uh, but that is a ministry we've been a part of. I've been asked to do something, and I'm not going to do it until after the service when the choir's back down here because there's a hundred of them in the choir. Amen. Um, don't let me get out of here. I've, I'm, I'm supposed to turn around and take a selfie with everybody behind us waving to send to those kids in Africa and let them know all the churches that are that are supporting and praying and, and rallied behind them. So don't let me forget to do that. And I know y'all will be mad time I get through preaching, but remember to smile when we do it. We want them to know we're happy about serving the Lord. Amen. <laughs> so, amen. So what a blessing it is to be in the Lord's house today. Very excited about that ministry. Uh, got a few announcements that I want to share with you. Um, we are at this time uh, open for greeters. If you'd like to be a part of the ministry that greets at the door, uh, kind of the face of the franchise on Sunday. You can, you can help us stand out there and greet. If you'd like to be a part of that, please let us know. Uh, we'll get you plugged into that. Also, tremendous reports from our team in Kenya. Uh, they have had, through, through medical mission, dental mission, street mission, and the churches they've been able to get into, there's been over 700 professions of faith uh, on this trip. It's incredible. Amen. Amen. And uh, we're so thankful for how the Lord's using them. Uh, they've been in a, in a wide region doing all sorts of things. Tiffany's actually pulling people's teeth. Yeah, let that minister to you. Amen. Uh, so we're going to offer one of those here when she gets back. So if you've got a bad tooth, let me know. I can get you in for half price. Amen. No, we're excited about how the Lord's using them. Our men got to go into a church this morning and preach. Uh, there were two young men whose father preached the gospel in this, in this village for the first time, and he was murdered. Those two kids were orphaned. They got into Compel Orphanage, went through the school, surrendered to ministry, went back to the village where their dad was killed, planted a church, and our group went today, the first white people that village has ever seen. And they went in there and preached the gospel to them today. I'm talking about our men from the church went in and got to preach the gospel. Incredible. Amen? Amen. And, uh, and not to shortchange our ladies who were right there with them. Uh, ministering and loving on folks and blessing. And, uh, and so listen to this. Jay, Kevin, and Wayne led worship, and all they had was a drum, and I told them we want to repeat when they get back. I don't know how that's going to go, so y'all be praying. We're going to have a special Sunday night service when they get back to, to honor their effort, but be praying for them this week as they continue their mission. They'll be flying home Thursday and Friday, so we're going to be praying about that. Also, the junior youth group is going to be leaving tomorrow, headed to camp, or to, yes, Tomorrow headed to camp, so we're praying for them, praying for tall timbers. Amen. Very excited about their group that's going. we got a hundred things going on. Uh, Jessica's doing good. Many have asked about her. Thank you so much for your questions there. Uh, people have brought us food. I couldn't hardly button my shirt this morning, and this is one of my big shirts. So some of y'all who fluctuate know what I'm talking about. you got the big stuff. you got the little, you know what I mean. So anyway, this is the, this as big as they got, and uh, I'm going to have to get some, you know, anyway. So things are going good. Amen. Very thankful for that. We're having to slow her down and so excited about uh, the progress that she's made. And we appreciate so much everyone who's prayed for us there. Uh, she's doing good. And if she gets just a little bit down, I'll go in there and wink at her two or three times. And she's right back up. So all's good. When you got it, you got it. Amen. And so uh, <laughs> is what it is. Vacation Bible School starts uh, uh, here next week. We're going to be starting on the 10th. Uh, very excited about what's going on. We need a teacher for third and fourth grade unless we've got it. Have we found that teacher yet? All right, Stan, you in? Nope, okay, we're still looking for a teacher. Third and fourth grade, if you'd like to help us out with that, it's going to be a couple hours each night. It'll be a blessing to you, I promise you. So please pray about that and let us know. That's the last spot that we need to fill, and then we can use all the help beside that we can, but that's one of the leadership spots we definitely need. So let us know. Uh, Miss Allison's uh, phone number is in the bulletin, which is always fun because you can prank call whoever puts their number in there. 
And uh, you text her and let her know if you'd like to be a part of that. We're excited about Bible school, praying about it. Invite somebody, let them know we are back uh, with VBS July 10th through the 15th. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, we'll have family night on the 15th on that Friday night at 6 o'clock. We want all the church to come to encourage and support those kids, meet their families. Uh, and we're going to have finger foods after. So there's something for everybody. Amen to that. Christmas shoebox ministry is in there. There's items that are listed in your bulletin that you can bring up here to start uh, getting ready for that. Very excited about that ministry and know it's going to be a blessing. Uh, we always show out with that and we need you to help us continue to do so. Men's prayer breakfast, July the 24th. We'll meet that morning for the service at 8.30. We'll have uh, fellowship, breakfast, a time of prayer and devotion. So join us for that. Uh, July the 25th, the 25th, we're going to be doing a one-night men's Bible study that Monday night. So men, uh, get ready for that. Very excited about what the Lord's doing in that ministry, and we know that's going to be a blessing. Is there any other announcement? All right. Well, we're very excited about that. Do not let me forget the selfie after the service. We, we have the unique uh, uh, deal here at Antioch where our birthday as a church falls on July the 2nd. Uh, which was yesterday, 123 years, ABC 123, amen. Were y'all ready for it today after last week? And then we have on July the 4th a celebration of the birth of our nation. And so we're very thankful today for the country that we get to call home. Very thankful to see you in here today to support your church and to support your country, and we're looking forward to what the Lord has in store for us today. Homecoming was an unbelievable success. Brother David did a tremendous job, as with our worship group. Oh, hey, and the cooks showed out. Amen. I, I promise you I've had no less than 25 people tell me that was the best homecoming this church has ever had. And, and only about half of them have been here for all of them. Amen. So 123 years. All right. Thank you. I needed some help. I needed some help. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask his blessing on the service this morning. Father, we love you. We thank you today for your love for us. We thank you for the privilege we have to live in what we still believe to be the greatest country on planet Earth. God, we pray today for our nation. We pray for the leadership uh, in our nation. And we pray, Lord, for some that might feel, fall under the category of the lack thereof. But, Lord, we recognize today that beyond uh, uh, political seats, we recognize today that first and foremost and above all, uh, we are subject to the Lord God Almighty. And we pray today that you would have the reins in this country, Lord, that you would control, uh, Lord, the, the, the motivation that moves those who lead us. Thank you, Lord, for a good country. Thank you for a good church. Thank you, Lord, for a good day to come and recognize both and to celebrate the God who's been so faithful to give us the blessings we've enjoyed both as a church and as a nation. So, Lord, today as we worship, let us do so mindful of the fact that we are in a country that has been touched and favored by God. And, Lord, may we never forget it. Bless this place today. Fill it with your presence. Let us know when we leave here, even though we, we look forward to singing and to preaching, Lord, I pray today that what stands out the most is that we've been in the presence of holy God. So move in this place and do what you came to do. We pray your will be done. If there are those who need to be saved today, may they be saved in this service. And we pray that everything said and done bring honor and glory to the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you. We praise you. And, Lord, we look forward to what you're going to do today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. In honor of our country, could we please recognize our veterans this morning? I'm sorry I forgot to do that. Veterans, the United States Armed Forces are active duty. If you would please stand, let us honor you at this time as we wouldn't have a nation if it weren't for you men and women. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen to that. Praise the Lord for them. I'll never forget the time we did that and Tiffany stood up. She thought we were giving them a standing ovation and, and it was her and all the veterans standing up. So when she gets back, thank her for her service. Amen. <laughs>
Didn't this band do good this morning? Y'all help us as we sing 10,000 Reasons. sing this with us.
surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. I'm no longer Why? I hit the button. I know I do. But I guess something else turns it back on. Maybe when I drop my shirt back on it. <laughs> I couldn't help but think about how much the Lord has done in our music ministry over the last several years. You know, when we first came, that was before we got Brother Ross. And, of course, homecoming is actually his anniversary. So he's been here now for eight years leading worship for us. Amen. Y'all give Brother Ross a hand. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. And uh, the only one he hadn't been able to run off is Brother Charles. Been with him for the duration. Uh, the old drum sat over here untouched for years. And uh, well, the Lord provided there. And uh, seeing that band full. Who, how many churches you know got their own mandolin player? Come on now. Amen. Amen. 
We got a got a bass bass player going on up here and keyboard uh, on occasion and Miss Tiff's out. Miss Whitney's up here singing. We got three people leading worship instead of instead of just one. Some folks can't find one, and we got three up here. Amen. Go on, give the Lord praise. Amen. I'm just thankful. I'm just thankful for all that the Lord's done. And uh, of course, there's been some stumps in the field through the years, but God's been faithful. And, uh, he has never let us down, and I, I'm thankful for that and give him all the glory for it. Uh, all right, let's talk about anger. If you've got your Bible, Ephesians chapter 4, open there. Well, y'all think I'm joking. That's where we go. Ephesians chapter 4, we're just going to read one verse. We will get into the context of the Scripture, uh, but, but join us there. In Ephesians chapter 4, we're going to read one verse, and then we'll take off from there. Stand with us, if you will, as we honor God's Word. Ephesians 4 and verse 26. The Bible says, Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. I want to be careful that you understand, again, what the Bible is saying. The Bible says, Be ye angry. But listen to how he says it. And sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. So I want to talk to you this morning and preach as the Lord gives liberty on the subject of anger. Father, we love you. We thank you today, uh, Lord, for your love for us. Thank you that you provide our need. Thank you, Lord, that you know the end from the beginning. God, I'm reminded every day just how feeble of a people we are. Lord, it seems like a good day will be followed by a bad day, no matter how we are at our best. It seems like we always find a way to stumble. It, no matter how good it seems things are going, it seems like I can always find a way to mess it up. But God, right in the middle of that, we see our faithful, steady, and true God. Lord, I'm thankful it's not up to me. I'm thankful that it's not up to us. We are a collaboration today of unfit and imperfect people. But one thing we believe today is you are God. And in that we worship you, we trust you, and we express today how desperately we need you. Move in our midst. Be the God of our lives and our hearts and our church and our world. And Lord, we pray today you'd speak in power and let us leave here better because of our experience in worship and in the presence of God. Bless and have your way in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And you can be seated. Paul, if you studied with us in the book of Acts, probably had his most pleasant and fruitful missionary journey and stop along the way in Ephesus. He, he was met here with a people that were hungry. A people who were willing to, to sit and to listen and to grow in faith and in knowledge of the Word of God. And it was a pleasant stop. And for one stretch of his time, it was the longest stop that Paul had had along his missionary way. Until he got to Corinth. Which you know as well as I do, Corinth was a different story. <laughs> Corinth was a carnal band of misfits, and he had his hands full dealing with the church at Corinth. But in this relationship that he has with Ephesus, he writes a, a, a passage in chapter 4 that speaks to the new man, ha having cut off the old man and put on the new man, and he kind of sets the stage, and, and even, you could almost pin this like a parenthetical. But right between two big statements is this one little phrase in verse 26 and 27 that if you're reading and you're, and you're paying attention, it does kind of jump out at you, does it not? That God says, hey, be angry. But then he couples that with that statement and sin not. See, there is something to be talked about this morning as it pertains to anger, and that is that I would say 99% of the time anger's wrong. I, I've heard people say, well, they got, a, they got a bad temper. Well, they need to get rid of it. Amen? They, they've got a quick trigger, and we make excuses for people to just keep acting as big a fool as they've always acted. And that's just not right. If God's God and He's working on us, I ought to be getting better at something. Amen? And so this thought of anger, most of the time it's wrong, and the reason it's mostly wrong is because we get to the point of sin when it comes to our anger. Now I want to say this to you, anger is an emotion. And emotions are a very interesting thing because I don't think any two people are set up emotionally the same. 
People say, well, you know, she's got emotional issues. Well, my goodness, I don't know anyone who doesn't. Now, now some manifest themselves in more hurtful ways and, and troubling ways than others, but we're all emotional to a certain extent. Every LSU fan in here, when you hear the, the, the whole of that tiger, you get emotional. Amen. You might not cry or, or break down, but, but you, you, I, if you're like me, if you've ever been there when they played it on Saturday night, the hair will stand up in the back of your neck, make you want to run your head through a wall. Amen. Especially when they're playing Arkansas, Brother Earl. Amen. I don't want to talk about Alabama. <laughs> but I am saying to you that we're an emotional creature. But here's the thing we've got to always remember. Everything about our original makeup has been contaminated by sin. And so once sin shows up, then everything has been tainted, including our emotions. Now, emotions we hear a lot about, of course, anger is one of those things. The definition of the word emotion is a natural instinctive state of mind deriving from one's circumstances, mood, or relationships with others. Well, you know as well as I do, our circumstances, our moods, and our relationships with others change, as do our emotions. My pastor pastored his first church at Florine, Louisiana, and the church had every pastor that had ever passed the church at that time. This was in the early 70s or late 70s. The, the, the church was over a hundred years old, and every pastor of the church, they had a picture in the, in the hall of every pastor, and underneath it, they had his favorite scripture and a quote. Well, when Brother Jeff pastored there, they got his picture, put it on the wall, and underneath it, I don't remember what scripture he used, but the quote he said was, I'm not saved by a feeling, but it sure feels good. Listen, emotions are a good thing when they're understood and managed properly, but they're not the main thing. I tell people when they come in the office and need to be saved and talk about the Lord, I've told them, you, you might feel chills up and down your spine, but you might not. You might laugh, you might cry, you might not. None of that means you're saved. What, what means you're saved is that you have accepted the promise of the Lord Jesus Christ to be faithful to His Word when He said that if whosoever will call on the name of the Lord, be saved. So then we put our faith in the promise of the Word of God. And may, maybe it feels good, but here's what you find out if you've been saved for 15 minutes, is you'll feel bad again one day. And I'm glad that even when I feel bad, and even when I don't feel saved, I'm still saved, not because of me, but because of His Word and His promise. Good to be a child of God. Amen? So talking about those emotions, let me, let me say to you a couple that we're very familiar with. One, we understand anger. Anger is an emotion. But we hear this other one a lot, and that's anxiety. Now, these are two things that have been brought out by sin, that, that, that have been developed and tainted in us by sin. I'm not saying if you have anger that you're terrible or that if you have anxiety. I believe we all, to some degree, have anxiety. But you understand, those things were given to us for a certain reason. And when used adequately, you understand, anybody that's ever struggled with or been with somebody that struggled with anxiety, there, there's this thing they call fight or flight. It's a natural instinct. You want anxiety, but you want it to be healthy. I mean that if there's a grizzly bear in your living room, you don't want to just sit there and watch TV. You, you want anxiety to a degree that you've got sense enough to either get a gun, shoot the bear, or get out of the house and let him have it. Amen. But, but, but you want a certain healthy degree. But because of Adam's fall, all of this stuff gets contained. And so we live in this fallen state where we have to work so desperately hard to manage these and control these emotions. And we thank God that we have a God that understands us. And that's able to help us when we go through those seasons of not understanding. So those emotions. Now I want you to think about something else as we consider that. I want you to think about the fruits of the Spirit. So the Bible says in Galatians chapter 5, in verse 22 and 23, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. So these are the fruits of the Spirit. These are the things that should be evident in your life if you are indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God, meaning if you're a child of God. So when you put our anger that Paul is encouraging, that Paul is saying to us on the inspiration of God, be angry. But you have to look at it through the lens of I can't approach my anger or engage in my anger if it's going to cost me or sacrifice the fruit of the Spirit that's in my life. So can I be angry while maintaining the joy of the Lord? Can I be angry and still love the person I'm angry with? Can I, in anger, approach a certain issue and be able to do so with peace? Can I do this and navigate my anger with long-suffering, which is what? Patience. Can I be angry and patient at the same time? Well, according to Ephesians 4.26, I can and I should be. 
But I can't be angry and not patient because then it's going to lead me to sin. If I'm angry without joy, I'm going to be in sin. If I'm angry and not able to love, then I'm going to be in sin. If I'm angry without patience, if I'm angry but not gentle. Now, men, we struggle with this. Amen. On more than one occasion, I have tore things up in anger. First time Jessica and I were dating, and I tried to build a deer stand. I had a 10-foot base that I had acquired somewhere, and I built a box, and it was nice. But I didn't properly attach that box to the base. So when I went to stand it up, the walls came a-tumbling down. And when that happened, I picked up a metal folding chair and disassembled the rest of it. And when I turned around, she was walking in the house of my mom and daddy's place like, he's crazy. But she still married me, amen? So she's crazy too. Can I get a witness in here this morning? If we're, if we're angry but out of control, if I'm angry and violent, if I'm angry and hateful, if I'm angry and without joy, if I'm angry and without peace, angry and without patience, angry and without faith, if you're not careful, here, here's what will happen. I, I sit in these places. It's hard, it's hard to be a pastor and to be a minister and also to be a red-blooded American and to look at the things going on in your country. And I, I want to, you know, sometimes I want to turn off my praise music and get back to Merle Haggard. If you're walking on the fighting side of me, amen. You're running down my country hoss. You're walking on the, amen. I see these, these, these people walking up and down the streets while all my people are at work. And I want to go get the church bus and take a load of our good old boys up there and wipe out the whole crowd. Amen. That's my, that, but see, I'm, t I'm, 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 I'm humoring you, but that's not right. You understand what I'm saying? I, I can't let my anger override my faith. And my faith is in the Word of God. And the Word of God says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I have on multiple occasions talked about how I felt when I saw our White House lit up in rainbow colors. God saw it too. He knows. And I think the part that balances the anger is I get so mad at what I know the sin in this country is invoking in the heart of God. And I know in the back of my mind, God is not happy. And when you look at something like we did a couple of Sundays ago and how God dealt with Sodom and Gomorrah and you realize Sodom didn't have a single church, Sodom didn't have a Bible study, Sodom didn't have a Bible, they didn't have a pastor, they didn't have a preacher, a missionary, an evangelist. We've had all of that and made the same choices. God is not happy with the United States of America because of sin. And it's hard for me, when I feel that bubbling up in me, not to be angry to the point that I let it extinguish my faith. Well, my faith is this. This creation belongs to God. I had an altercation with a lady at a pharmacy this week in which I probably sarcastically made the comment, but I called her sis. <laughs> she said something about me having an attitude. I said, hey, sis, I'm just giving you back what you've been giving me. My wife's been cut on for four hours. I'd like to get my prescription filled if it's not too much trouble for you who is here eight hours to fill prescriptions. To fill my prescription. Anyway. Hmm. You're so sick of that attitude with people. If you work at a hamburger place, you ought to be happy when I come get a hamburger. Amen. Only reason you got a job is because people come get the hamburgers. If you work at a grocery store, bag the groceries with a smile. Amen. Nobody, you bag your own now. But, but be happy. You don't have a job if you don't have a customer. Be happy. <laughs> Amen. Lest I fall into anger and sin. I, I can't let my anger, so I was so proud of myself because when she smarted off to me about calling her sis, I said, hang on. According to the word of God, under, under the hand of creation, you and I are brother and sister. And this lady standing behind her went, mm-hmm. <laughs> Amen. If I'm not careful, my anger will get so big, my faith will fall away, and I won't see her as my sister. And when I don't see her as my sister, I'm not going to treat her right. I don't care how ugly, how mean, how black, how white, how anything, that's my sister. Don't get quiet on me while I'm preaching good. That's my people. God created her just like He created me. Amen. And she's just not managing her anger, right? Because she's got a bad attitude. And I'm a missionary from Farmerville, come all the way to Shreveport to help you get it right. 
<laughs> Amen. I'm glad to do it. Had all the Shreveport I want for a little while. Amen. I could when we crossed back into Union Parish and the roads got bad. I knew I was home. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> when I get angry to the point that I lose control, when I get angry to the point that I'm no longer meek, you, you can't be snarky and help somebody. You can't have you have to manage yourself to the point, and it's hard for us. It's hard. Because I want to be angry, but I want to be angry and do something. Amen? I want to be angry and, and make them cry. I want to make them hurt. But that ain't right. He talks about it when we have anger, but he tells us we can't do this and set aside being gentle. We can't set aside being good. We can't set aside being faithful. We can't set aside being meek. And lowly, I like the statement I heard a guy say one time, if you think being meek is weak, try to be meek for a week. Amen? And here's the one, temperance which is self-control. You've got to be able to control yourself. Or you're going to hurt somebody and you're going to hurt yourself. And yet, with all of that, God tells us, be angry. Be angry. What a challenge this is to us as we try to manage this emotion of anger and we consider not only the emotional context, but the fruit of the Spirit that we must not let go of or, or disqualify by our anger, but consider then, what is the object? then of the anger it's not them and it's not you it's sin and the problem with sin is it's not just your problem and the problem with sin when I look at them with the rainbows when I look at them with 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 I mean I mean did you ever think people would protest for the right to kill a baby and they're out fighting and, and, and some women, ugly as a mud fence. I don't think it was ever going to be an issue for them. I, I mean, you're all right, sis. <laughs> Amen. You've got a long way to go before you. <laughs> Amen. Because it takes two. You know what I mean? So here we are. That's my sister. Not, not as a Christian child of God by any means, but by creation. Under the creative hand of God. Me and hers got the same problem. Hers is manifested in that kind of ignorance. Mine is manifested in other ways. But the anger is not to her. And it's not to those people. It's to them. And here's what I find out. It's to their sin. And here's what I find out. Is if it's to their sin, then it's also to mine. So in this writing and in this text and in this scripture, here, here's what Paul kind of drops on the Ephesian church. Verse 17 through 25, he, he's getting us to these passages. He talks about kind of the preparation of the heart of a person who can be able to do this. What? Be angry, but sin not. He says, verse 17, I say therefore testify to the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God, through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given uh, themselves over to lasciviousness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ, if so be that you have not heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. Verse 22, that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, that old carnal, sinful man that God saved. He's got to go. Take that off, he said, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts and be renewed in the spirit by your mind and that ye, listen, he said put off, but now he says put on. Put on what? The new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away all lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. He got after them liars too, didn't he? Stop lying. Stop, stop walking in the old conversation. Stop acting like you used to act, being like you. You got to take off the old man and put on the new man. And I fear that the reason we don't see much of the new man is there's not near as many new men as we think there are. A lot of people have learned how to do church and we've learned how to say amen. We love the angry part. Be angry. Get them, Jesus. Amen. 
Go get them. Get them heathens. Not recognizing that he has just as much cause to get me. I have lost control of myself too. I have, I have suffered in my faith. I have lost temperance. I have not been meek. I have been without self-control. I've been without love and without joy and without patience and without peace. So if we're doing this, let's do it all together. I'm not saying that we ought not take a hard stand. And that's what Paul said. Be angry. But there's a preparation that has to be in place in order for you to be angry. And that is that you need to put off the old man and put on the new man and watch your mouth. <laughs> the old conversation needs to change. You need to quit all that lying. Quit all that, all that suit thing. Quit all that getting involved in worldly behavior and carnal things. Enjoy the things of God. Be in the new man. And here's what I do. The, the, the matter I get at somebody else's sin, it never takes me long before God starts shining a light on my own. So he talks about the preparation of being angry and sinning not. Then you see the product, or rather the plan, verse 26 and 27. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down on your wrath, or your anger, you could say. Neither give place to the devil. What a statement that is. What he's saying to us there is that we're giving place to the devil when we do that. Now he says in verse 28 and 29, this is the product. He says, let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good that he may have to work to him that needeth. His saying is, let the person who stole steal no more. Let him be changed. Let him come along and work for what he's got. But don't you love the way the, the Word of God presents this? Here he says is the whole purpose of being able to work and have so you can give it to somebody who needs it. That, that's a different mindset than what we've got. Different mindset than many churches today. Different mindset than the United States of America. It, it's not get it so we can give it. It's get it so we can go get some more. I like the statement, we get all we can, we can all we get, and we sit on the can. Now, if you can't do it, get stopped up, you're going to have a problem. And that's not what, we're not called to be a reservoir, we've been called to be a river. We've not ca called to be a holding cell, we've been called to be the conduit of the love and the blessing and the favor of God. And as long as we understand as a Jesus church, as a mission church, as a sending church, as a ministry church, as long as we understand nothing we have is our own, including the breath that we breathe and the lives that we enjoy, everything we have. When we came to the altar and we gave our lives to Jesus, we said, Jesus, take the will, amen? Take the reins of my life. Take everything, and it's yours now, and you use it as you see fit. He says, verse 29, again, the product, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. That what you say ought to help people, not hurt people. So he talks about the preparation, 17 through 25, the plan, verse 26 through 27, the product, verse 28 and 29. Now, within these two verses, within these two verses, there's three very simple statements. After he says, be angry, which we all understand, and we're all like, hmm, yeah, let's be angry, amen? Let's go get them. He says, be angry, first thing he says, and sin not. Don't let your anger get you to a place where you're in sin. I'm not saying that we should be a bunch of sissies. Matter of fact, I am far on the other end of that equation. Amen? I'd rather err on the side of toxic masculinity than not being able to know what you are. Amen. But in that anger, sin not. And I think there's a, a, an underlying understanding that you and I both know is it does me a lot better when I take my time to be angry and not let my anger produce a rapid response because here's what I know. Most of the time that I rapidly respond, let's be honest, I'm wrong. Amen? I, that's why like I heard the, uh, the black church, the choir sang a song, you better keep your business off of Facebook. Oh, keep your business. Off of Facebook, amen, all together now. You, better, you know what I'm saying? Because the first thing you do, you get upset, and you don't even have time to get home or get to the store or get to your family. or get Before you say something, you jump right on Facebook like somebody cares about your constant commentary and got to give your opinion and your view and your report only to find out that either what you heard was a lie or you overreacted or misunderstood. I'm preaching to the choir. 
It's been not my sister, not my brother, it's been me. Amen. There's been that exact person that knee-jerk react to something. because, And it's not because it was an impure thought or reaction. It's because I'm so angry about what's wrong in this world. I don't want to see wrong. I don't want to see bad. But the devil knows how to push those buttons and make you respond in a way that's unfavorable for a Christian. And then we've got a black eye in the community. We've hurt people. You can't take it back. You, you can put front page news and be wrong when they print the retraction. It's on the last page three weeks later. It don't matter how good your apology is, it's never going to be received with the same oomph that the accusation was. So just calm down a minute. God knows. He's in control. It's all right. Be angry, but sin not. And when you gossip, you sin. And when you run your mouth about something you don't know about, you sin. And people get hurt. And people get brought back. And then you can go all around that stump. But you say something, you can't take it back. You can apologize for it. You can fix it. But you can't undo what's been done. So take a deep breath. Hang on just a second. God's still got it. Sin not. The second thing he says is let not. Listen to what he says. Don't you let the sun go down on your wrath, on your sin. You and I have then the propensity when we get angry to push this boundary into sin. And what he's saying is, when you do so, don't let it fester. There's no time for us to be mad at each other. There's no time for us to hurt each other and let it sit. If you're wrong, make it right. If he stole, let him steal no more. Get things right before the sun goes down. Don't let it come to trouble because as it festers and marinates, it only gets worse. You and I have both been in situations where you know something was said that shouldn't have been said and before you had time to stamp it out, it's done got to 50 people. And then you can't possibly run every, every run down and get it all right. And you know as well as I do as well, by the time it reaches the 50th person, it's a whole new story. We used to play that game when we was in children's church. We'll pass the word. By the time it got through 20 people, it, was, it wasn't even the same thing. It's an incredible thing. Sin not, let not, and listen to this. He says, do not. Do not. Neither, he says, give place to the devil. So th this word phrase, give place to the devil, th this is what I want you to understand what he's saying. Now, some have described it as a foothold. Some have described it as an opportunity. But this is exactly what it means. When I get angry and sin and let the sun go down on my wrath, I have at my table went and taken a seat and brought it in and welcomed the devil a seat at my table. That's given place to the devil. Who in this church, in their right mind, would go get a chair at a, at a table where your family and the Lord Jesus Himself are welcome and pull up a table for Satan? That's what you do when you let your anger provoke you to sin and you don't deal with it. When your anger drags you to sin and you don't deal with your sin before the sun goes down on your wrath, you have welcomed the devil to the table and I'm telling you, then the trouble's just getting started. So he says, sin not, let not, and do not. Here's what the Bible says, Psalm 97 verse 10. You that love the Lord hate evil. We're supposed to hate evil. We're supposed to be angry. But we're not supposed to let it motivate us to the point that the emotion overrides who we are as believers and we fall into sin. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16, the Bible says this. So what am I supposed to hate and how am I supposed to hate? Well, here's one thing I know. Love what Jesus loves and hate what He hates and you'll be in good start. Amen? Proverbs 6, 16, This six things doth the Lord hate, seven are an abomination unto Him. How many of these apply? A proud look, a lying tongue, and this was just overturned. And I like what somebody said. We're celebrating what the, what, what, the, what the Supreme Court did in overturning Roe v. Wade. But what they did was nothing. What they did was admit that they made a mistake when they made the first ruling. And it only cost 63 million lives before they fixed it. Here's what the Bible says God hates. Hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. Feet that be swift in running to mischief. A false witness that speaks lies. And listen to this one. He that sows discord among the brethren. That's what God hates. 
So we ought to have, or Jessica tells me I'm not supposed to say that. We should have, we ought to have, I always say ought to, amen. We ought to have hate towards the things that God hates and love towards the things that he loves. Psalms 4.4, 4, the Bible says, Stand ye in awe and sin not. So how do we approach this anger? Here's what James says. James 1.19, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, or slow to anger. He doesn't say that a man shouldn't be angry. Jesus got angry when he walked in the temple and they were defiling the house of prayer and he flipped tables over and got a whip and chased them out of there. That's my Jesus. I agree with Brother Bill said one time, there's some guys I believe I could bring to the altar and whoop and have the hand of God on me the whole time. I mean, there's some times to be angry, but James is telling us how to be angry and it's not knee-jerk, overreacting anger. It's be slow to anger. Prepare your heart. Know what it is that we're angry about. And approach with understanding, patience, faith, goodness, how we should engage in anger towards sin and the things of sin. And this is kind of what Jesus deals with when Jesus says in Matthew 7, in the, in the process of judging, He says, Judge not that you be not judged, for with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And with what measure you meet, it's going to be measured again unto you. Why do you behold the mote that's in your brother's eye and consider not the beam that's in your own? His point is, why are you looking at their sin and not yours? Why are you holding a magnifying glass and, and ignoring the mirror? But he doesn't say that we should ignore their sin. What he does say is he continues on, how will you say to your brother, let me pull the moat out of your eye and behold, there's a beam in yours. You're a hypocrite. But he says, first cast out the beam that's in your eye and then you can see clearly to cast the moat out of your brother's eye. The point is, I do need to address sin. I need to preach against sin. I need to stand against it, teach against it, be against it. But I can't do it as long as I've got sin in my own life. So I'm angry. And the longer my anger stirs, the more it seems to circulate. <laughs> Jesus would make a statement, you sow to the wind, you reap of the whirlwind. You start pointing out sin, what they say when you're little, if you point in one, you got three pointing back at you. It's not that we should not be angry about the sin that's going on in this world. And I'm going to close with this statement. Let me read you three quotes. I wrote them down, I hate not to read them. Spurgeon said, when I hear of anyone losing his temper, I always pray that he never finds it. <laughs> Such tempers are best lost. Billy Graham said of anxiety, though we have less in the world to worry about than previous generations, we have more worry. Though we have it easier than our forefathers, we have more uneasiness in our lives than ever before. Though we have less real cause for anxiety than our predecessors, we are inwardly more anxious. It's because of the absence of the presence of God that we're seeing in this country as a result of sin. Dwight Moody said of sin, I've had more trouble with myself than I have any other man I've ever encountered. So, with that, we should adamantly oppose sin. Stand against it. And the sin that's trying to overthrow our nation. People parading up and down the streets, forcing agendas down our throat. We should be against all of that. We're not going to do any good. There's not one person in here that, that's trying to protest that we should be about abortion. There's not one person in here today that's trying to protest that we should sponsor or uplift or try to drive the agenda of the LGBTQIA community. Nobody. But, even though they're not in here, they're out there and we're against them. I get it. We'll never help the sin that's outside of this building until we deal with the sin that's inside this building. We'll never help the community outside these walls until we fix the calamity that's inside these walls. And that is when I recognize today what he said. You want to be angry at sin? You better be angry at sin. Because it'll cost you your marriage. It'll cost you your relationships with your children. It'll cost you your job. It'll cost you your well-being. It'll cost us this church. Be angry and sin not. But recognize the sin that should make you matter than any sin in this world is the sin that burdens your soul and troubles you every day that you try to walk with God. That's why he said we ought to be a living sacrifice. <laughs> Stay on the altar.
Keep it right before God. Don't you be scared. I'm telling you, if you've got something bothering you, you get on this altar every time we meet and you ask Jesus to help you. And I don't care what somebody's a matter of fact, I'll, I'll get angry with them. Amen? If somebody's got something to say about you, oh, he goes down there every Sunday. Bless God, you ought to come down here too. You'd quit worrying about them and you'd come get right yourself. Amen? Be angry. Sin not. And I fall into sin when I recognize that you're the problem and I'm not. They're the problem and I'm not. God's not going to skip the church to start revival. He's not going to bypass his people to get this country right. You want the country to get right? It is going to start in the house of God. When we decide we're so sick of our sin, we want to help them with theirs. But as long as we let theirs make us feel better about ours, we never, ever, ever going to see God move like we want to. Be angry. Be angry and sin not. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. If you know there's something wrong, deal with it. Let him that stole steal no more. Let him that lied start telling the truth. If you got sin in your life today, repent. Don't you let the sun go down not one more day when you know there's sin in your life that's keeping you from doing what God's called you to do. Don't you hide behind somebody else's downfall. Lord, what do you want me to do? Isaiah said, Lord, I'm a man of unclean lips. You ought to get in this altar and say, God, forgive me and help me and fill me and use me to change this world, but start it with me. I like what the old mans used to say. Old preachers used to have a statement about revival. I know you've heard it, Brother Jesse. When you're praying for revival, draw a circle around yourself and pray for revival in the circle. We need help. But he's a very present help, our refuge and strength in a time of trouble. And I can feel it. I can smell it. I can hear it. I can taste it. God is getting ready to do something. And whether or not you want to be a part of it, it's up to you. I want to be a part of it. I want Antioch to be a driver, amen, in what God came to do in this world. And so God, help us to get our hearts right, and let's go change the world. Stand with me. Father, we love you. We thank you today for what you've done for us. God, we thank you today that, that you give us a word to help us manage the things that you put in us that sin has destroyed. And God, even though we've been tainted by sin, We've been saved by your grace. And we've been given power to be overcomers and conquerors through him that loved us. So God, for all that that seeks to do us harm, we know that you can use it for good. Even our anger, even our anxiety, even our stress, even our, our, our hurt, our sorrow, you can take that and use it to bring something wonderful out of us. So I pray we'd just surrender ourselves to the God that can do that. Lord, bless this invitation. If there be somebody here today that's never been saved, I, I, maybe they've got anger issues or, or emotional issues or those things that, that have troubled them and haunted them and kept them from being able to serve the Lord. Maybe we've all fallen into this trap where we look out at the sin and the things in the world and we get so mad and so sick that we realize, Lord, or fail to realize that there are issues right here at home, right here in my heart, right here in our church, in our community, that must be paramount. Before we can reach sea to shining sea, we got to get our house in order. But Lord, if there's somebody here today that says, I just can't do it because I don't know God, let them come and be genuinely saved today. Lord, let us respond in a way that'd be pleasing to you. And let us, Lord, be angry about sin, but not any more angry about anyone else's than we are our own. Lord, help us to be as Jesus exhorts the church at Laodicea, to be zealous and repent. Lord, bless this invitation. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 You come if you need to come this morning. Let the Lord have his way. He's mighty good. Amen. Amen.